Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast entitled Trace Metals Analysis for the Pharmaceutical Laboratory. I'm Jerry Workman, the Senior Technical Editor of Spectroscopy, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are pleased to bring you this webcast presented by Spectroscopy and sponsored by Milestone and Agilent Technologies. Milestone offers a complete suite of innovative technology solutions for microwave digestion, sample preparation for metals analysis, direct mercury analysis, organic extraction, ashing, and synthetic chemistry processes. With over 50 patents and more than 25,000 instruments installed worldwide covering large and small research institutions, as well as universities and industrial laboratories, we are the acknowledged industry leader in microwave technology. For more information, please visit www.milestonefci.com. Agilent Technologies leads the industry with robust, reliable instruments that provide the ability to analyze, confirm, and quantify substances of interest. Our workflow solutions enable you to maintain stringent practices from sample preparation through analysis to final report. When combined with our informatics architecture, large quantities of data can be managed while preserving the integrity and security of the results. Agilent offers a complete line of atomic and molecular spectroscopy, GC, LC, MS instruments and technologies, as well as the related consumables, support and services. For more information, please visit www.agilent.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We are pleased to be joined today by Eric Farrell and Bastian Georg. Eric Farrell is the product specialist for the digestion and clean chemistry lines at Milestone, Inc. Eric obtained his bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Union College in 2005 with a focus in inorganic chemistry. Prior to joining Milestone, he worked in the particle characterization field as a laboratory manager and in domestic and international sales, where he supported sales and applications across all product lines. Bastian joined Agilent as an atomic spectroscopy ICPMS application scientist in June 2018. Bastian holds an MS degree in geology from the University of Munster, Germany, and a doctorate in geochemistry from ETH Zurich in Switzerland. After completing a three-year postdoctoral research term at the Earth Science Department at Oxford University, Bastian joined the Trent University Water Quality Center in Petersboro, Canada in 2010 as senior ICP MS research scientist. Bastian's research record of numerous peer-reviewed publications has been cited over 3,000 times and comprises research in environmental chemistry, cosmochemistry, isotope geochemistry, and trace metal analysis. Thank you for joining us today. Eric, please get us started. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Eric Farrell, and I am the product specialist at Milestone for microwave digestion and clean chemistry. In today's webinar, we will be talking about what to consider when evaluating microwave sample prep and analytical tools for trace metals analysis of the various types of pharma and nutra samples you'll encounter in your lab. To kick us off, I'm going to summarize what we will be discussing today. First, we'll discuss the analytical process importance of sample preparation, and where digestion and metals analysis fits into the larger picture. 
We'll briefly cover the new USD chapters applicable for the pharma and nutra industries. We'll also discuss the types of samples one will encounter in a pharma or nutra lab and things to consider to ensure you choose the optimal system for your lab's needs. There are various solutions for closed vessel microwave digestion, so we'll cover the rotor based and single reaction chamber solutions that Milestone offers. It's always nice to hear what others have to say, so we'll give examples of labs similar to yours who have invested in Milestone technology and the benefits they've realized. Once we finish discussing the sample prep portion of the analytical process, we'll pass it on to our Agile partners, who will then discuss the various solutions they offer on the metals testing side for the pharma nutra industry. So the goal of any analytical process is to obtain data in the end, but there are a few steps we need to take to get there. The first part is sample preparation, which is where Milestone comes in. Here, we take the sample to be analyzed and turn it into a fully dissolved liquid. Once we have our sample prepared, it is then put onto an ICP or ICPMS, which will yield your analytical data. This is where our Agilent partners come into the picture, and they will be discussing this aspect later. It's very important that your sample prep process is robust and able to handle the various samples you will encounter which will result in the fully dissolved sample your analytical instrument needs. So the new USP chapters have been around for a number of years now, so I'll briefly review it for those of you who are new, but most of you should be aware of it. The new chapters consist of 232, which are the limits of elemental impurities, and 233, which is the procedure or actual methodology that allows us to reach the limits set forth in Chapter 232. Chapter 233 has two procedures for analysis, one for ICP-OES and one for ICP-MS. It also speaks about sample preparation, which we will discuss shortly. Chapter 2232 applies to elemental contaminants in finished dietary supplements and focuses on the big four. Next, we'll talk about evaluating the different types of microwave digestion systems for your lab. When selecting a microwave system, there are a few key questions you need to ask yourself. The first question will be, what are my sample types? Are you testing APIs, final products, excipients, or raw materials? If I know this information, then I know the temperatures I need to reach, which will dictate the rotors or configurations to purchase in my microwave. What are my elements of interest? All pharma neutral labs will be looking for mercury. For this reason, you will want to make sure that the configuration you choose can handle the pressures generated by the types of samples you'll be testing, so any venting is minimized. What acids do I need to use to get my elements of interest stable in solution, and which can I use? What temperatures will be required for digestion, and what will be the pressures generated from the decomposition of the sample? What is your expected throughput now and in the future? It's important to understand how many samples you'll have when you start up and where you see your throughput will be going. Once I know this information, I can make some informed choices. There are a wide array of sample types which you will encounter in your lab, and understanding their properties is important to selecting the right microwave configuration. As a rule of thumb, the higher the organic content of the sample, the higher the pressure will be generated as CO2 and NOx gas once the acid decomposes the matrix. Typical pharma samples include APIs, raw materials, final products, or excipients. Nutraceuticals can include oils, herbs, and dietary supplements, to name a few. For digestion of these sample types, nitric acid is typically used, as well as hydrochloric acid, to stabilize volatile elements such as mercury. Hydrogen peroxide may also be useful if using a rotor-based microwave or digesting stable organics. For the most part, hydrofluoric acid is not typically required unless you're looking specifically at elements such as silicon or titanium. If you're not interested in these elements, you can simply forego this reagent. The sample size required for digestion will be determined by the J value, dilution factor, and final volume. 
If a higher sample mass is required or the sample is highly reactive, make sure to take this into account when selecting the appropriate microwave configuration for your lab. It's important to understand that temperature is the factor that drives digestion quality and pressure is just a byproduct. To illustrate the importance of temperature on digestion, we digested two API samples keeping all variables the same except temperature. In test one, we digested at 180 C and in test two, 30 degrees hotter at 210 Celsius. Now, if we look at both samples, you will see that the one on the left digested at 180 C is yellow and the one on the right digested 30 C hotter at 210 C is clear. The yellow color is indicative of residual carbon content which is essentially undigested organic material. This can cause many issues on your analytical instrument, such as carbon buildup on the interface cone or polyatomic interferences. So as you can see, just by going 30 degrees hotter, we have a clear solution, commonly referred to as visual clarity, which is the target of any digestion. This helps to illustrate why temperature is the driving factor in digestion quality. Now let's take a look at the various microwave options available for laboratories such as yours. There are essentially two different types of microwave digestion systems available. Rotor-based systems, shown on the left, and single reaction chamber technology, shown on the right. First, we're going to talk about rotor-based systems, which many of you may already be using in your lab. Milestone's version of a rotor-based system is the Ethos Up. Rotor-based systems feature individual reaction vessels and a carousel, which are processed in batches. The Ethos Up has a large cavity to accommodate multiple rotor types to fit a wide variety of application and throughput needs. The system is completely constructed in stainless steel, and there is no front window, which we have seen as the path of least resistance should something happen inside your microwave. Milestone offers three different rotors for our Ethos Up to fit various temperature, pressure, and throughput needs. However, I would like to focus in on our Maxi 24 HP high performance rotor, which was developed specifically for the needs of labs such as those in the pharma nutra industry. This rotor can process a single up to 24 samples at once. Its higher temperature and pressure capability of 220 C and 60 bar makes it ideal for handling most pharma and nutra samples. This rotor, similar to our others, uses Easy Temp technology to control the temperature. With Easy Temp, the temperature of every vessel is monitored and controlled off of the hottest. This is not only for safety reasons, but also to ensure our vessels do not vent excessively, which is important since many of you will be analyzing for mercury. The vessels utilize a simple three-component design, only requiring simple hand tightening to assemble and close. This makes it ideal for busy lab environments where ease of use is critical. In the case where your samples might be highly reactive or a higher sample mass is needed because of J values or detection limits, our SK15 high pressure rotor may be a better fit. This rotor can process a single up to 15 samples and has the higher temperature and pressure capability needed for samples such as more difficult to digest APIs or other highly stable organics. The value in the Ethos Up is that it's highly configurable and can accommodate any rotor you might need now and in the future. Rotor-based microwaves have been a staple for years in labs around the world performing trace metals analysis. They're great because you can achieve higher temperatures and pressure than you can with an open vessel system since you're limited by the boiling point of your acids. Being able to reach higher temperatures means shorter digestion times and using a closed vessel means full recovery of your elements of interest and less contamination. The rotor-based systems are typically considered the workhorse of the lab. They do have some limitations inherent to the technology. Vessels do require some assembly and disassembly, more so with high-pressure rotors since their higher pressure capabilities require a more robust design. Not only this, but vessels typically need to be cleaned after each run in one manner or another. Since all rotors of rotor-based microwave systems are made of polymers, you can only go so hot for so long before you compromise its integrity. 
since digestions take place in individual reaction vessels, we want to run similar type samples together to ensure they all digest completely as different sample types require different temperatures to digest and generate different pressures and can have varying reactivities based on their composition. Lastly, the components which make up a rotor, particularly the vessels, can be somewhat expensive. Now, in order to overcome the limitations of rotor-based technology, Milestone developed Single Reaction Chamber, or SRC, technology. The first single reaction chamber system was introduced in 2006 as the UltraClave. Five years later, in 2011, we released the UltraWave. The UltraWave is a smaller benchtop system with full acid compatibility. Any type of acid, including aqua regia or concentrated HCl, can be run all using vials with loose fitting caps. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how SRC works because it's different from rotor-based systems. In fact, it's completely different. But do you remember how I told you you have to batch samples with rotor-based systems? That's because each are independent reactions going on and you're only controlling the temperature of one at a time. Here, you have all of your vials with loose-fitting caps fitting down in a base load in a larger vessel, which has water and acid. It's this base load that absorbs the microwaves and subsequently transfers it to the vials. This way, they can all react independently within the base load, and you know they're all getting to the maximum temperature of the base load and can build pressure up to 200 bar. Some of you may be concerned that we utilize loose-fitting caps. We are actually able to do this because we pre-pressurize the vessel with 40 bar of nitrogen, which acts as a gas cap and keeps all the vials independently closed. As the pressure builds, it equalizes on the inside of the vial as well as the outside. Because of this, we can use disposable glass, quartz, or TFM vial for any of those three in any combination. Now let's take a closer look at the system's operating sequence. First, you weigh your samples into vials. This can be done directly on an analytical balance, add reagents, and place the loose fitting cap onto the vial. Next, the rack is lowered into the reaction chamber containing the base load. The system is clamped and pre-pressurized to 40 bar, which not only acts as a gas cap, but also prevents cross-contamination between the samples. Next, the microwave program is started and our samples are digested. Once the digestion program has completed, the ultrawave will utilize a powerful external chiller, which accelerates the cooling process. Once the system has cooled to about 80 degrees Celsius, it will automatically depressurize the system. Once depressurized, we open the reaction chamber, dilute up our samples, and put them onto the ICP or ICPMS. Now let's take a look at the differences between rotor-based and single reaction chamber technologies, particularly when it comes to workflow. Here is a comparison of how samples are processed using both technologies. With rotor-based systems, since digestions take place in individual reaction vessels, you'll need to run similar type samples together. For example, if you have an API, raw materials, packaging material, or capsules, you want to run those separately, since these samples require different temperatures to digest, generate different pressure, and have varying reactivities. Now with the ultrawave, since all samples are at the same temperature and pressure condition, we have the ability to run mixed batch samples. So here you can see I can run all four of those different samples in a single run. When running a mixed batch of samples on the UltraWave, we choose the microwave program which will digest the most difficult sample. You cannot over-digest a sample, but can certainly under-digest. To illustrate the differences in productivity between rotor-based and single reaction chamber technologies, Let's look at a comparison of samples being digested using a 24-position rotor, such as our Maxi 24 HP, and the 15-position rack on the UltraWave. Here we compare the time it takes for various steps in the digestion process. For comparison purposes, the same microwave conditions were used for both systems. Weighing samples, adding acids, and capping only takes about a minute or so with the UltraWave where it can take much longer with rotor-based systems. 
This is because the UltraWave uses vials with loose-fitting caps, which have no assembly or disassembly required. Cooling is going to be much faster on the UltraWave, since it uses an external chiller, whereas cooling with a rotor-based system is simply air passing across the rotor within the microwave cavity. Vessel disassembly at the end of the digestion is non-existent with the UltraWave, since it uses vials with loose-fitting caps. Now, if we look at the total number of samples run in an eight-hour shift, you'll see that the UltraWave can provide about twice the throughput compared to rotor-based systems, which is a real number, especially for a busy lab. This slide really shows the differences in sample prep workflow and handling between the two technologies. The UltraWave's use of vials with loose-fitting caps really does save a significant amount of time in the sample prep process. As you can see, the only time needed here is to simply weigh the samples into the vials, whereas rotor-based systems require additional vessel handling and assembly. Though so both rotor-based and single reaction chamber technologies are excellent solutions, the UltraWave really does provide some significant advantages which our users in the pharma nutrient industry have found highly beneficial. The UltraWave can reach higher temperatures and pressures than possible with rotor-based systems. This is very useful in cases where a lab may encounter a highly stable organic, such as some APIs or complex final products, where higher temperature may be needed to achieve complete digestion. This also provides a level of future proofing, meaning virtually any sample that comes across your lab bench can be digested. This is particularly useful for contract labs that encounter a wide variety of matrices from their clients. Workflow of the UltraWave is very simple, utilizing vials with loose-fitting caps. No vessel assembly or disassembly is required, thus helping to improve your lab's throughput and decrease labor costs. Any mixture of samples can be digested in a single run. This not only lends itself to higher throughput, but also allows for simplified method development. If you have a precious or valuable sample or need to reach low detection limits, a single digestion run can be used to determine the optimal digestion conditions. With the UltraWave, the only minimum acid volume is that which is required to completely digest your sample. The UltraWave can be run with any type of reagent, all using vials with loose-fitting caps. Not only are labor costs reduced with the UltraWave, but operating expenses as well. The cost of vials, caps, and racks is much less than that of a rotor and their respective components. Vials are available in disposable glass, which requires no cleaning, as well as quartz and TFM for achieving lower detection limits. A powerful external chiller is used, which not only keeps the UltraWave at a safe operating temperature during the digestion process, but also supports higher throughput by actively cooling the system once the microwave heating program has completed. With the UltraWave being a high-performing microwave system, it also has many hardware and software safety redundancies built right in. Next, I would like to share the stories of a few labs who have taken advantage of our sample prep solutions to help support their lab stringent analytical demands. First is Chemical Solutions, a contract lab based in Pennsylvania that specializes in USP work, but also handles other applications such as biologicals, food, medical devices, and cosmetics. They service roughly 400 different clients from a wide variety of industries. This means the sample types they work with and detection levels needed can vary greatly. They needed a microwave digestion solution which could support their approximately 4,000 samples per month, which are analyzed using 7 ICPMS and 2 ICP OES. To support these needs, they initially invested in the UltraWave, then added additional units to support throughput including the EcoSup with SK15 and Maxi44, and one Trace Clean. More on this shortly. They use the UltraWave primarily, as the sample types they work with are very diverse and its mixed batch capability highly useful. This has allowed them to process samples with different masses and acid chemistries in the same run, such as complex excipient, talc, and titanium dioxide. Furthermore, the UltraWave's capabilities have allowed them to offer very quick turnaround times, sometimes even the same day in some cases. The 
ethos up with SK-15 and Maxi-44 rotors are mainly used for large numbers of samples, which do not require the aggressive temperatures and pressure needed by the ultralamp. And below is a quote from their web director, which gives their perspective on the technology. For those of you not familiar with it, the Trace Clean is an acid steam cleaning system by Milestone, which automates the cleaning of any sample prep components compatible with acid from vials to ICP torches. The system is fully automated and takes about one to two hours for the cleaning cycle to complete. Following cleaning, components are cool and dry and can be stored in the system's clean environment until needed. By using the trace clean, you can eliminate the need to clean vessels in your microwave or even use it instead of an acid bath or other less efficient cleaning techniques. Next is For Life a manufacturer of nutraceutical supplements. They had previously outsourced all their elemental testing to a third-party contract lab. Being faced with an increasing sample workload as the company grew, they wanted to bring their analysis in-house as the cost and turnaround time was becoming significant. The lab invested in an Ultrawave and an Agilent 7700X ICPMS. They were attracted to the Ultrawave's mixed-batch and disposable vial capability. There was practically no learning curve, allowing them to quickly utilize the system and eliminate their sample prep bottleneck. Sample types they process in-house on the Ultrawave include plant material, fish oils, liquid vitamins, topical creams, tablets, and gel caps, to name a few. And below is a quote from one of their chemists, which gives their perspective on the system. Before I pass it to our Agilent partner, I wanted to summarize the important things to consider when selecting a microwave sample prep system for your lab. In order to obtain the quality analytical data you need, it's vital to make sure you have a solid sample prep technique. This not only includes the sample prep method itself, but also the hardware to handle the samples you'll be working with. You'll need to consider the sample types you'll be digesting whether it be APIs, raw materials, final products, excipients, or dietary supplements, such as oils, herbs, creams, or tablets. Make sure that whichever configuration you choose has the appropriate temperature and pressure capability to ensure you can achieve complete digestions of your samples at the masses required. It's also important to consider what your throughput is now and what it might be tomorrow. If you're interested in a rotor-based microwave system for your lab, our Ethosuff with Maxi24 HP is the ideal solution. It has the temperature and pressure capabilities needed to process most of the pharma nutra samples you'll encounter. For labs needing that next step up in throughput and productivity, our Ultrawave with 15 position rack has become the go-to solution. It's our most common configuration for the pharma nutra industry and has a great balance between sample mass capacity and acid volume. We have a large install base within this industry, including both rotor-based and SRC systems. As a frame of reference, our split between them is about 60% in favor of the Ultrawave and 40% the Ethos Up. As I pointed out above, it really depends on your throughput needs and sample types. Thank you very much for your attention, and with that, I will pass it over to Bastian. Thank you very much, Eric, for your presentation, and I also would like to welcome everyone to today's seminar. My name is Bastian Georg, and I am the ICPMS Application Scientist for Agilent in Canada. Today I would like to show you how easy it can be to adopt ICPMS for elemental impurity testing pertaining to pharmaceuticals and nutraceutical samples. By partnering with Agilent, it can really be as easy as one, two, three, and the best part is Eric and our partners from Milestone have already covered most of step one, the sample preparation. Before we get into the specifics, I'd like to do some housekeeping. Agilent has been at the forefront of ICPMS development since the early 1990s. Back in 1994, Hewlett Packard released the first benchtop ICPMS system, the 4500 platform. In 1999, the instrument to Development Division was spun off from Hewlett Packard and was launched as Agilent. In 2000, Agilent released the hugely popular 7500 ICPMS series, some of which we still see in operation today, 
giving testament to the high quality and instrumental reliability that our customers have come to expect from Agilent. The 7500 was later followed by the third generation 7700 in 2009 and the fourth generation ICPMS instruments, the 7900 and 7800 in 2014 and 2015 respectively. Then in 2012, Agilent revolutionized the field of ICPMS with the release of the first ICP MSMS system, the Agilent 8800, which was succeeded by a more powerful system, the 8900 in 2016. So what you see here is 26 plus years of dedicated R&D in the world of ICPMS, which led to a market leading suite of great products. So with housekeeping done, let's talk about how easy it is to use ICPMS for elemental impurity testing. When considering atomic spectroscopy for elemental impurity testing in pharmaceutical or nutraceutical samples, three techniques come to mind. Atomic adsorption, AA, ICP optical emission spectroscopy, or ICP mass spectrometry. Now, while each of these techniques has a unique set of merits, ICPMS is arguably the most versatile technique due to a superior combination of analytical sensitivity, robustness, and multi-elemental coverage. ICPMS is the only atomic spectroscopy platform that can perform any application pertaining to elemental impurity testing following USP Chapter 232 and Chapter 2232 and might therefore be the best choice for your laboratory. Let me now show you how partnering with Agilent gives you an advantage due to the highly developed hardware as well as purposely designed software features both of which will allow for straightforward sample analysis and data reporting. The analysis of pharmaceutical and nutraceutical products using ICPMS is rather straightforward. The most critical aspect is planning and sample preparation. Our partner Milestone has just taken care of most of this work for us, as Eric has just shown. Due to Agilent's ICP hard and software, the Agilent Advantage takes care of steps two and three which are data acquisition and data evaluation. Let's define our targets first. As elemental impurities, we define any element, unwanted or purposely added, such as zinc, lead, cadmium, mercury, and many others, that are accumulated throughout the production and remain with the API, the final drug formulation, or in case of nutraceuticals, with the final supplement. There are several sources for elemental impurities such as starting raw materials, reagents, catalysts, but also manufacturing infrastructure and the intended addition of elements. All of these can lead to accumulation of elemental impurities in the final product. Testing for impurities is needed to ensure the accumulated levels of any element is not adversely affecting the safety of the final pharmaceutical or nutraceutical product, such as, for example, producing an unwanted toxicity effect. There are a few protocols that provide guidance on which impurities have to be tested and how testing should be done. For pharmaceutical products, USP Chapter 232 defines the permitted limits of impurities depending on the way of drug administration. The limits for nutraceuticals are defined in Chapter 2232. The analytical procedures and validation for both 232 and 2232 are outlined in Chapter 233. Chapter 232 and 2232 define the permitted daily exposure or PDE limits for each to be tested impurity in micrograms per day. The PDE limits depend on the way of drug administration, with limits for inhalational pathways being the lowest and thus can make for the most demanding analytical requirements to meet detection. For instance, the daily dose of a drug administered through an asthmatic inhaler meets the limits for toxic lead set out in Chapter 232, if the daily dose of that drug contributes no more than 5 micrograms of lead per day during administration. In general, while oral PDE limits can often easily be met by icp OAS, parenteral and inhalational PDE limits may only be achieved by detection limits provided by an ICPMS. For nutraceutical products, PDE limits are only defined for Class 1 impurities cadmium, lead, inorganic arsenic, and inorganic mercury. 
Here, impurity testing can be performed on either the finished product or on the aggregate of all the components used in the final product, with PDE limits varying accordingly. For successful analysis, there are some planning steps that need to be taken. First of all, what type of material is going to be analyzed? This will largely determine the best way for sample preparation prior to ICPMS analysis. Sample preparation is the most important aspect, hence the choice of a suitable dissolution or digestion procedure is paramount. Second, which impurities need to be analyzed? Not all impurity classes need to be analyzed in every product. Third, determine J-value. The J-value, more about this in a few slides, is a very helpful construct that combines daily drug dose, the respective PDE limits, and sample preparation metrics, such as the final dilution volume, into one single convenient number. Based on those JL values, we can prepare standards, calibration solution, and reference materials as required, as well as spike our sample. And usually we need to perform a validation of the entire procedure through defined tests, as outlined in Chapter 233. When characterizing the product to be tested, it is important to know the way of administration, such as oral, parenteral, or inhalational pathways. Note that due to different PDE limits, the amount of material used for dig digestion may vary. Another consideration, what is being analyzed, the final product, raw materials, or the final supplement? So what sort of sample ma matrix do we need to process? Once the samples are fully characterized, we know what we are dealing with. We can proceed with the most suitable sample preparation process. Then, next question is, which impurities require testing? If following USP 232 for pharmaceuticals, all elements in class 1 and 2A need to be tested for in every product for all routes of administration. Any elements from classes 2B and 3 added intentionally during the production have to be tested for in all routes of administration. For instance, if gold was added intentionally during the production, it has to be analyzed for as impurity in the final product, no matter the way of administration. Some class three impurities also have to be tested for in certain parenteral and or inhalational products, if not intentionally added. For example, lithium has to be tested alongside class one and two A impurities and parenteral and inhalational drugs. Class three impurity molybdenum has to be analyzed alongside class one and two B in inhalational drugs, but not in parenteral or orally administered drugs. For nutraceuticals, chapter 2232, only class one impurities need to be tested in the final product or on all the components used in the production. Let's talk about our best friend, the J value. When analyzing drug products for elemental impurities, three important metrics have to be taken into account during the data evaluation. A, the permitted daily exposure limit, or PDE. How much of any impurity is deemed safe for consumption? B, the maximum daily dosage of a drug. How much of a drug product may be taken on a daily basis? And C, the sample preparation metrics, such as final dilution volume of the weighted and digested sample. Now, J combines all these three variables into a single convenient number. In essence, J is the PDE limit equivalent concentration of a given impurity in the processed and analyzed sample. It directly relates ICPMS data to PDE limits of impurities in any given drug and for any given way of administration. For example, the equation here calculates J value by dividing the PDE limit by the product of total dilution and maximum daily dose of, dose of the drug. Let us assume the following scenario. The calculation yields a J value of 0.02 ppm, or 20 ppb, for a given element. If the measured concentration in the ICP test solution is less to or equal to 0.02 ppm, or 20 ppb, and thus equal to or less than 1 J, consuming the daily dose of that drug is not exceeding PDE limits for that particular element. The drug can be deemed safe with respect to that element. 
If, on the other hand, the ICPMS measured concentration in the test solution is greater than 0.02 ppm or 20 ppb and hence greater than 1 J, consuming the daily dose of that drug will exceed the PDE limits as outlined in USP 232 for pharmaceuticals or 2232 for nutraceuticals. Using J allows for the direct comparison of concentration data obtained on the ICPMS with the drug's PDE limits for considered impurities, without having to back-calculate concentrations in the sample solution to concentration equivalents in the product. Calculating J-value is very useful and makes data evaluation a lot easier. However, it can be cumbersome, especially when multiple impurities with different PDE limits need to be tested. The example above shows my J-value spreadsheet calculator. The table contains PDE limits here for oral medication. It allows me to enter the weight of the material used for sample preparation, the final digestion volume, and the daily max dosage for the drug in question. Based on these inputs, the spreadsheet calculates the total dilution and combines the value with the PDE and max daily dosage into 1J for each impurity. Now, having calculated 1J allows me to quickly compute the J levels for my calibration solution, as well as any spike amounts required for spike testing. I can now go and mix my solutions to the appropriate concentration levels for ICP calibration and spike testing. So with the pre-planning, sample processing, and same calculations done, calibration solutions, QC, spike solutions, and sample solutions are now ready to be analyzed using ICPMS which gets us to step two, ICPMS analysis. I will show you in the next few slides how the powerful features of Agent's ICP mass under software make setting up and starting an analytical run very efficient with minimal manual intervention by the operator required. Agent 7800 ICPMS provides the ideal ICPMS platform to perform impurity testing required under USP 232 and 2232. Combined with Agilent's SPS4 Auto Sampler and Agilent's ISIS-3 Flow Injection Valve, sample analysis can be fully automated and efficiently scaled to production levels. Agilent's ICP Mass and Dust software comes with powerful features that allow for almost 100% automated setup. Here, only a few manual interventions are required. Step 1. Plasma Startup and Warm-up. The startup routine can be configured to include a series of instrument calibrations, such as torch alignment, detector calibration, nebulizer gas flow, mass calibration, and a performance report of instrument performance. After that, the instrument hardware is fully calibrated and the instrument is ready for analysis. Step two, batch and sampler setup. Now this is the only point where some manual intervention by an operator is required during the entire setup. After creating an analysis file from the pre-made template, all the operator may need to do now is to import a sample list, either from a CSV file or by manually entering, and placing the sample tubes into the audit sampler, saves the file, and push it into the analysis queue. Step 2 can be accomplished in as little as 1 to 2 minutes, especially if samples come preloaded into racks from the laboratory and the operator only has to place those loaded sample racks into the sample. Step three, data acquisition. As soon as the analysis file is pushed into the queue, Marsunda's algorithms will perform a complete instrument tune to optimize the instrument for the specific analytical task ahead. The tune performance is checked against user-defined performance criteria, and the analysis proceeds. The analysis begins and Mars Hunter uses calibration standard solutions for detector crossover calibration, using the very target analytes to give the utmost linearity of the detector for each analyte in the analysis method. As data is being acquired, Mars Hunter Data View allows for online live view of results, QCs, checks, and even for on-the-fly data reprocessing if required. Setting up a brand new analysis file and template is effortless using preset methods for USP 232-ICH chapters for pharmaceutical or nutraceutical analysis. With a few mouse clicks, MassCenter writes the analysis file for you. The tune mode is pre-selected, the analyte table is pre-populated, 
including internal standard correction and even a QC table with the PDE limits for oral, parenteral, and inhalational drugs. Before running the analysis file, the operator only has to populate the sample list. For only a few samples, this can quickly be done by manually entering the information. For larger batches with hundreds of samples, all required information can quickly be imported with a few clicks from the CSV file. The example here shows the repeated analysis of aspirin samples. The required information for gel calculation is being entered, and the appropriate PDE reference is chosen as sample type. In the background, MassCenter calculates gel values and automatically compares the measured concentration against the PDE limits in the QC table, here for oral drugs. MassCenter by default references to 100% or 1J level. However, flexible J reference levels can be set for customized J level testing and spike recovery testing. While MassCenter takes care of instrument setup and data acquisition, it also takes most of the heavy lifting of data evaluation over from the user. Step three, data evaluation. Let MassCenter do the heavy lifting for you. Masenta uses the entered information from the sample list to calculate expected J equivalent concentration and it automatically references the measure of the concentration against the appropriate PDE limit. Back to the aspirin example from the previous slide. Here Masenta has acquired the data, performed the calculations online and in the background being acquired. Masenta then compares measured concentrations, here for arsenic, against the expected value for 1J for oral PDE limit. Should Marsender find the measured concentration exceeding the J level, here 100% or 1J, the result is flagged and thus brought to the operator's attention. Let Marsender do even more of the heavy lifting for you. Validation procedures for pharmaceutical USP 232 and nutraceutical USP 2232 analysis is outlined in USP Chapter 233. The precision test assesses the repeatability of the analytical setup. To perform this test, six independent sample preparations have to be performed. All six samples have to be spiked at the appropriate J level. The spike has to be added prior to sample preparation. The six spiked and processed samples are analyzed and the obtained result population must have an RSD of no more than plus minus 20%. The test fails if repeatability exceeds 20%. To test for ruggedness, repeat the repeatability test either on a different day, on another instrument, or by a different analyst, or a combination of those three. Note that only one of the three criteria must be met in order to meet USP 232. The result population must show an RSD of no more than plus minus 25% in order to pass. And again, let Marsenta do the heavy lifting for you. Besides helping with the data evaluation, some of the validation can also be done by Marsenta. Here, the spike recovery report is chosen. The report automatically performs the statistical analysis on a set of appropriate spike samples to assess the repeatability. In the next example, multiple tests obtained on different days or by different operators or obtained on different instruments running MassCenter can be compiled to perform the ruggedness test. Just select the ruggedness report template, add data files to the report engine and press OK. MassCenter will perform those calculations as well as display pass and fail evaluation. Agent 7800 ICPMS is the ideal ICPMS platform for analysis required to meet USP 232 and 2232 limits. The system has a plasma robustness, matrix tolerance, and interference removal capabilities required to accomplish USP and ICH analytical tasks, even in demanding samples. Powered by Agent's ICP Mass Hunter, the system can be set up to operate efficiently and with minimal user intervention. Accessories such as Agilent's SPS4 Auto Sampler and Agilent's ISIS 3 Flow Injection System allow for convenient automation setup and for efficient scaling to production levels. If required, all ICPMS platforms integrate seamless 
with agilent 1200 series LCs and 7800 series GCs for hyphenated speciation work. And partnering with Agilent doesn't stop with the ICP MS analysis. Agilent's expertise and software solutions can be set up in a compliant environment. Agilent offers installed ICP instruments to be validated and qualified by our service engineer. The Equipment Qualification Report, EQR, is a self-contained, traceable, and audit-ready electronic report of an instrument meeting acceptance criteria. The EQR also includes supporting documents, such as calibration reports and training records, and is electronically signed and locked to prevent alteration. Agilent offers software solutions for settings that require compliance to 21 CFR Part 11 guidelines. In the front end, Mars Center for ICP allows for secure instrument control, data acquisition and processing. Access controls allow for custom-made group project and user management. Database administration and data storage can be handled by SDA or OpenLab backend solutions. Consumables. Besides ICPMS and software, Agilent also provides a wide range of USP-ready working solutions. For instance here, a set of solutions containing all classes of impurities for all PDE limits. Others are available as well. So partnering with Agilent provides an entire workflow solution. Besides ICPMS hardware and mass center software, Agilent solutions for pharma laboratories also include SOPs, instrument qualifications, software solutions supporting compliant environments, consumables, service, and training. Add a strong partner like Milestone, and rest assured, pharma applications can be as easy as one to three with Agilent. And with this slide, I would like to thank you for your attention and would hand back to our moderator, Jerry, for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Eric and Bastian, for such an informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your presentation window. Our first question is, in instrument parameter-wise, how does the helium flow affect the counts per second or intensity counts? For instance, if my helium flow for cadmium is 3.6 and I lower it down to 3.2, what will happen? Yeah, thanks for the question. And, uh, yeah. um, well, obviously, But if you just wonder what happens if you increase or decrease the flow, so if you decrease the helium pressure in the cell, the tone rate of the that gives you because less gas in the cell means more higher temperature. Yeah, thank you. The second question is how to control. How do I control the, the lead leaching or contamination from glass vessels? Very good question. Thanks for that. Um, so for most applications, disposable glass vials are um, available to achieve the necessary detection limits, especially when working with the big four. Uh, however, if you do have some ultra-low detection needs, you can either do a rinse uh, of the vials, or you may even decide to move some of those specific samples from disposable glass over to, say, quartz or TFM. Uh, an advantage of the ultralate is that you can mix and match vial types depending on your needs for specific sample types. The next question is, you mentioned total digestion. How do you know that total digestion is achieved in gelatin samples without using HF? Well, that's another very good question. So um, for the most part, uh, gelatin is organic, which means that you're going to, the primary acid you're going to be using is nitric acid, uh, maybe a little bit of hydrochloric acid for stabilizing mercury. Um, however, you can, HF, hydrochloric acid, can be used 
in cases where there may be some silicates in solution that you may want to completely digest because um, gelatin, if it does have any silicates left over as it is uh, from uh, plant material. So um, that really uh, depends on what you're, what you're working on. And our next question is, I'm new to metals testing and have very little experience with digestion. What type of support do you provide? Another very good question. So uh, as far as support, um, we, in, inside our, with our terminal for um, the Milestone Ethos Up and the UltraWave, we do have, not only do we have the pre-installed methods, but we also have a, a post-sale support team, uh, applications team. Uh, we're able to assist with any uh, training you may have. Also, any, any questions that uh, one of our users may have regarding, regarding digestions, they can either email us or um, give us a call or we're, even, we're able to uh, support however we can. We really true, truly do uh, value the partnership with our users and uh, both, both before you get the system and uh, during your time that you have it in your lab. And our next question is, how to make sure that the tuning is done properly in ICPS MS. Yeah, thanks for the question. I will take this again, and hopefully my audio now will work a little bit better here. Um, so when you have an agent ICPMS and you use one of our preset methods for USB, for example, uh, the tuning criteria are already written into the software. So all you would have to do is run one of the automatic uh, tune um, report functions and the system would go to the tune solution, pick it up, run a certain set of tests, and then it's bound to a pass-fail criteria set in, in, in your tune report. So on Agile and ICPMS, it's all pretty heavily automated. Um, just follow the guidelines and it should be fine. If you have a different ICPMS or you want to do it manually, then the good thing is with Mars Hunter, there's a huge variety um, and openness of how you can set up your own tune criteria, and you really can... Uh, make a pass or fail based on your own judgment. The next question is, you mentioned the 7800 is a robust ICP-MS. How do I determine and compare robustness of ICP-MS systems? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question because especially in pharma and nutraceutical applications where we encounter you know, a large variety of different sample types and matrices, we want to make sure that the instrument is able and capable to basically analyze every kind of sample we, we bring to it. So when it comes down to the determining how robust or then comparing which one is a more robust instrument, there's one performance criteria on, on every spec sheet that we can look at, and this is the oxide ratio, sometimes the CEO or CE ratio. It's usually given in percent, and that's the most determining um, performance criteria on the spec sheet that will say something about the robustness. So the lower the oxide ratio is of an instrument, the more robust and more efficient the instrument will work. And if you compare different instruments side by side, just look at the oxide formation ratio. You want to go with the one that has the lowest oxide formation ratio, and you can be sure that this is the most robust and most efficient ICPMS. Our next question is, what is the minimum acid volume I can use with the Ethos up and the ultra wave? So that's another very good question. So um, most vertebrae systems, um, regardless of the platform, do have a minimum acid volume. For the Ethos up with all of our rotors, uh, the minimum acid volume uh, is a reagent volume is five milliliters. However, with the ultra wave, one of the great benefits that it's able to afford our users is that uh, there is no minimum acid volume except that which is required to completely break down your sample. So I've had users that have worked with um, very small amounts of uh, sample mass or they need to reach low detection limits, so they need to do the highest amount of sample and the least amount of acid. So that may even be only one, two, or maybe even three mils. It all really depends on what the matrix is, but that's a very good question. And the next question is, can sample digestion be used as an extraction to analyze trace metals? So yes, that's another very good question. So what we're doing is the, the goal of any digestion is to get your elements of interest stable in solution. So um, for the most part, uh, that's going to 
um, that's going to be just nitric acid with a little bit of hydrochloric acid. Um, however, if you do have a sample matrix that is not broken, completely broken down by just nitric or HCl, um, just by using nitric uh, and HCl, just using those specific uh, reagents, you should be able to pull out some of your uh, elements of interest. This is frequently done in the environmental industry. For example, uh, some of the EPA methods for soils, those are actually uh, extractions uh, for your elements of interest. So the short answer is yes. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank the audience for attending and for participating in today's event. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Milestone and Agilent Technologies, for making today's educational webcast possible. You will receive an email alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks to all for joining. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.